The plaintiff was a motorcyclist and he'd run into one of our insured's trucks. He hit us. And you know, he wasn't very badly injured and this was pre-nuclear verdict days. He was a pretty nice guy and I was taking his deposition and said, well, what were you doing the day of the accident? And he said, well, I was riding around on my motorcycle, Mr. Zalid, and I would just stop at a bar every so often and I'd, I'd have a cold beer and a pickled egg. You're listening to Freight Famous, presented by Rose Rocket, bringing you the people that make trucking move from behind the scenes into the limelight. Here's your host, Justin Bailey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Freight Famous. My name is Justin Bailey. I am your host. I am co-founder and chief strategy officer at Rose Rocket. And today, I'm very excited to have our guest, Eric Zalad, partner and associate chairman at Benish Law. Today, really, and I, and I know I often intro the show with, I'm very excited. It's kind of thing you're supposed to say. But the reality is I've been looking forward to the show for a long time. Uh, one, Eric is here with us in person, which is always an amazing treat. Um, and we're talking about a topic that has and I'm almost embarrassed to say this, only really recently come onto my radar um, as I've been spending a bit more time uh, traveling again, I guess, back into the United States and seeing sort of, uh, you know, a lot of our customers and, and, and people in the industry and going to conferences and things like that. And the topic that I'm hearing probably as much as anything is uh, a term which, again, is new to me, nuclear verdict. And so... Um, Today, we're going to talk a lot about nuclear verdicts. I've had the pleasure of meeting Eric uh, before this and have heard him speak a little bit on this topic, and he's incredibly knowledgeable. Um, but I'll you know, let, uh, let him speak for himself and, and, and prove that to you as well. So, uh, Eric, welcome. Thanks, Justin. Good to be here. Right on. So I think maybe just start with how you got into this line of work. How does one become a, a, a litigator um, in the transportation space? Uh, good question, Justin. And first of all, uh, don't be embarrassed about knowing not knowing much about nuclear verdicts. It's a relatively new phenomenon. Maybe in the past five years, it's really expanded and proliferated. And also, it's a very uniquely American uh, mm. phenomenon. Our, our litigation system kind of lends itself, unfortunately, to these types of uh, cases. But yeah, I've been litigating uh, transportation cases, transportation litigation since, boy, I don't know, mid to late 90s. Um, I first got involved, my, my roommate from college worked at one of the largest trucking insurance companies in the U.S., and so he sent me a case, and it was a case down in Louisiana. The plaintiff was a motorcyclist, and he'd run into one of our insured's trucks. He hit us. And, you know, he wasn't very badly injured, and this was pre-nuclear verdict days. He was a pretty nice guy, and I was taking his deposition and said, well, what were you doing the day of the accident? And he said, well, I was riding around on my motorcycle, Mr. Zalid, and I would just stop at a bar every so often, and I'd, I'd have a cold beer and a pickled egg. And I said, what do you mean, a pickled egg? He said, well, there's jars of pickled eggs at all the bars, and so... That's what he was doing, and, uh, and that uh, kind of led to his accident, but uh, an example of how you can learn a lot about the regional culture through this <laughs> litigation. Um, the case went well, we won, and uh, I got sent more cases and bigger cases, and that has continued since that day, and I, I can't really eat breakfast now without thinking of a jar of pickled eggs. <laughs> Forever tainted. Um, well, for what it's worth, I, I think pickled eggs are, are pretty delicious. And I think I feel like I'm really aging myself by saying that because as a, um, you know, you don't say like, you don't say something like that when you're under 40. So I'm, 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 I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling now insecure about that statement too. So this is a big day of embarrassment and insecurity for me so far. You're dating both of us. <laughs> right. So I think I'm, I just, I really want to dive into this. So maybe it would be helpful if we just could unpack what is a nuclear verdict? Um, good threshold questions. So let me give you the technical answer and then a, a, some background statistics and kind of a, a history a bit of it, of the phenomenon's evolution. So technically, uh, a nuclear verdict is any verdict over $10 million, which is pretty amazing. Um, and there's a saying that 10 million is the new 1 million. So uh, this has kind of just started in the last five years or so. And I think in the last 
five to 10 years, the size of verdicts in truck accident cases, MVAs, motor vehicle accidents, has increased 967%. You know, and then it used to be the big verdicts, although they weren't as big, were primarily in fatality accidents, multiple mm -hmm. fatalities. But now, even in soft tissue injuries, minor injuries, non-fatal MVAs, we are seeing nuclear verdicts uh, across the U.S. Um, so that is a big change also. Um, and, and really, it's hard to use the term nuclear verdict without going hand in hand with a term called the reptile theory, which probably is an alien term to Canadians and maybe a lot of Americans, but I don't think it's an alien term unfortunately now to a lot of those in the audience who are uh, motor carriers or even transportation brokers. Uh, and the reptile theory is a, is a thesis now uh, that the plaintiff's bar in the U.S. has, and it's, it's a mode of trying the case, starting very early on in the case, through discovery and on through trial of instead of really focusing on the accident. I mean, sometimes in these cases, it doesn't even matter about fault or about proximate cause. But they, the theory is they seek to vilify the motor carrier. Uh, they typically seek to establish some safety rules uh, that, that might apply and that they get the representative to admit might apply. And then uh, hypothetically say they were violated, and the theory is to appeal to the reptile component of the juror's brain, mm. to vilify the motor carrier, the trucking company, and have them award a verdict that they think will punish uh, the motor carrier and deter the motor carrier for ostensibly bad practices, but, but they're re usually really not bad mm. practices. And um, it's, a, it's a new style of litigation. It causes one who defends trucking companies, such as me, to have a lot of different tactics that I wouldn't have dreamed of in the pickled egg era. Like what? But, uh, uh, one classic example is, you know, usually in litigation, this type of litigation and all litigation, I, I do some other litigation also, is you would present a witness, a corporate representative, to have his or her deposition taken by the plaintiff's lawyer. And you would never ask your own witness questions because you didn't need to. He or she was your witness. So you could always get an affidavit from that person later if you're trying to file a motion for summary judgment to get out of the case. You had that person. Uh, so you didn't need to question him or her at the deposition because you'd be giving away a little of your case to the plaintiff's counsel. Um, unbelievably, that has completely changed. So, you know, I, one of my theses is, and it's one of my five points, uh, is that there needs to be a very good corporate representative witness, and you almost always ask that witness questions. Mm -hmm which was anathema before. And so you were asking your own witnesses questions on redirect examination after the plaintiff's counsel has asked questions. And that is because, and we're getting into some of my five points here, by the way. Sure, and we'll, we'll come to those. There are five points waiting. We're gonna tease that out right here is that there is gonna be some action items um, that we're gonna to speak to, but we're gonna bounce around a little bit here. Just, as I said, I'm, I'm satiating my own curiosity. Yeah, no, no problem. And if we overlap, that, 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 that's fine with me also. But, um, what happens at these depositions of corporate representatives, sometimes they're called 30B6 dep uh, depositions because that's the rule that usually applies to these uh, depositions, but they're always videotaped like we're doing right now. So the witness is on camera and the plaintiff's lawyer will seek to do some of the things I described earlier. Talk about safety rules, create a safety rule and try to get the witness to walk into saying, oh yes, you're right, uh, we probably violated that rule. And there's various creative ways that they get to that point. And the whole point of the deposition is 
I would say about 15% of it is actually about the accident. Mm. The rest of it is about corporate safety practices, corporate safety history. A lot of times it's about the financial net worth of the company, and it's all on video. And so what happens is as the litigation proceeds, that video lives on. The plaintiff's lawyers play it to the judge at hearings. If there's motions for summary judgment, they attach the transcript or even sometimes the video. If there's hearings in advance of trial to eliminate some evidence, motions in limine they're called, they could play that video. And sometimes they'll play it at trial as a way to impeach the witness. So you normally would not, in the old days, uh, which are probably five years ago, you wouldn't ask your witness questions, but now you almost have to. And what you ask, and I just did this about a month ago, uh, what you ask are things like, tell me about the corporate history. Tell me about your community involvement. Tell me about how many miles, safe miles, your drivers have driven. And you go into a lot of questions on direct examination about the positive aspects of the company. And then you also react to some of the questions on that the were already asked by the plaintiff's counsel and rehabilitate those. Right. And then, so what happens then is, as the litigation proceeds, anytime they seek to play a portion of that video, you've got a portion you can play back. And that's a lot better than a more drier, uh, arguably attorney-created affidavit. So th th that's a new technique that I think is, you know, you, lawyers should be judicious about that because there's still the same instincts not to do it, but it should always be considered in these cases. So with, there's a couple things that jumped out at me there. One is that, um, is there a reason, there's sort of two part questions to this. So is there a reason that this has proliferated over the last five years? Was there, was there a, a law or a moment or a, a case that was one that created this, oh, there's an opportunity there? And I guess, and I couldn't help but pick up that there's these, what you sort of are talking about, styles or techniques or practices, is, is how does that become, um, how does that become known amongst the community? Like, how, like is there is there a, I don't know, like a conference for these lawyers? Like, are they teaching them how to do? Like, you know, I'm trying to understand like the almost the business side of um, why is this happening now, and why is there such a well, and how is there such a well defined motion um, on the um, on the plaintiff side of things? Another excellent question. Um, so, a few things. First of all, there was some article or book published by a member of the plaintiff's bar maybe maybe 10 years ago, um, and it was very analytical, and it, it was very reptile-oriented, and I mean the actual animal. It, it discussed the portions of the brain and the instincts and how they relate in human beings. Uh, I, I forget the author's name, I forget the title, and. I probably wouldn't save them anyway because right, I don't right. want to publicize yeah. them. Got it. But that created a stir amongst the plaintiff's bar. And then, of course, you combine that with there was a, a couple big fat jury verdicts. Mm. So that confluence, that perfect storm, created a lot of interest in the plaintiff's bar. The defense bar was a little slower to pick up on it uh, because you know we're not the ones who thought of it. Uh, and, and then how does it spread, Justin? Another excellent question. Um, the plaintiff's bar is very well organized. And, and, and I know this because I've been to conferences where plaintiff's lawyers who do this kind of litigation have spoken to us in the audience. And they have told us, I was in the front row, I think, that um, they are much more organized than those who defend the trucking companies much more cohesive. They share a lot of information, a lot of data. For instance, they share deposition transcripts of expert witnesses who uh, testify on the defense side. If they know a particular company, they circulate, they have listservs where they circulate an email inquiry. What do you know about this company? Have you ever taken uh, this company's deposition, any of its employees, and they will share it? Uh, and obviously, that helps. You know, that helps. The, I mean, and they're on offense, 
right? So they so they get to organize, they get to plan it. You don't see it coming until it's you. Even in the definition, you defend. So you're on you're playing defense all the time anyway, right? So they can kind of change the narrative, change the name. But it, and this is going to be a, a probably a pretty dumb question, but I mean, because I've seen it in um, personal injury law. Um, but I mean, this is it, to say this is predatory is probably not even. I mean, that's that's an accurate statement, right? This is this is fully based on. Uh, not necessarily <laughs> right or wrong, but it's an opportunistic. Uh, it is opportunistic law. Is that? Is I don't know if I'm saying this right, but yeah, I mean a, a few things. So that yeah, they're playing offense, and so they know more earlier, yeah. right? Uh, but you know, there's ways. I mean, if the defense counsel is aware of this theory, you know, more and more you kind of look into the plaintiff's lawyer a little bit to understand his or her history and, 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 and experiences. So if the defense lawyer is attuned to the fact that this could be a scary, troublesome case, the reptile theory could be involved, you know, you got to know that from day one, and then you can kind of, you're on defense, but you're better armed. And the defense bar, um, is less organized, so it, it, it's harder for us. But is it opportunistic? Um, you know, I'm a little biased, sure. right? I represent the defense, but um, yes, yeah. I believe it's definitely opportunistic. Uh, I think that you know a large verdict attracts lots of lawyers who want to try to do the same thing. Uh, I think that in these cases. Many times the damages that are awarded far outstrip actual damages. Can we talk about, so just I think to kind of frame it up, and then I want to jump into how to help our, our listeners uh, prevent or at least manage against this this type of exposure. Sure. Um, and which would be your, again, what the, the sort of the, some of the bullets that you've been kind enough to share ahead of the show. Um, but can we just, what is a, a maybe a, a particularly egregious case that comes to mind that will kind of help us understand because what you know when I heard some of the numbers when I first like I I was blown away by the size of the numbers based on what appeared to be the severity of the outcome. So maybe if you could one that comes to your mind just to kind of help paint the picture as we're walking through this, like what we're talking about here. Yeah, I mean I don't remember the caption, but I remember, I remember some of the circumstances. A sure. case in Georgia where I think the woman was in her 70s. She sustained soft tissue injuries. So by that I mean a weak back or neck pain. I don't even think anything broken, um, and, and I'm not deprecating injuries, but, and she was awarded $12 million. Mm. Um, there's a case in Texas, don't remember the exact caption, but again, not a fatal accident. No one died, and no one very seriously injured, where there was life care planning or anything. Uh, a little more serious than the one in Georgia. I, I think there may have been like a, a broken bone, and I don't minimize that either, uh, this driver hit a parked truck and was awarded, I believe, was $9.5 million. So, I mean, believe me, if I had more notes, I could list 15 sure, of these you know, or more. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there are so many examples that I think even if you're an objective observer, you would say, that doesn't seem right. right. Uh, and so there's... There's a lot of those examples, and some are more colorful, uh, but they, uh, they're they scary for, for for the defense bar and for those we represent. Yeah, and some of just, and even talking to some of some of our customers just about this topic, um, you know, they've they've said that they've had people, you know, you know, one of the guys was telling me the story. He said he had somebody hit his truck. Uh, he was driving the truck at this point, and he and he just got out of the car, and said. What do you want? Like, how much do you want? And you know, and the guy says, like, "I want five thousand bucks." <laughs> so he just, you know, it was just sort of this, this. It's almost like it's becoming a knowledge. And you know, and it was driving through. We were in Kentucky a few weeks ago, and there were signs up on the highway about this. You know, just sort of letting the the community know that there are um, the rewards to be had uh, for for involving yourself in an accident with a with a truck. Yeah, I mean, a couple points on that. I mean. Um Try driving through Louisiana. Yeah. I mean, every other billboard is for a plaintiff's personal injury lawyer. And um, as to park trucks, I know the audience also includes brokers. They're not immune to these cases either. And I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. So we had a broker client who brokered a load to a motor carrier, trucking company, 
unbeknownst to the broker client, that motor carrier subcontracted it out to another motor carrier. That guy parked his truck outside a VFW hall, parked legally. Uh, there was a car show at the VFW hall. The plaintiff had several beers at the car show. This guy was on a motorcycle also, had a passenger pulled out into the thoroughfare, past the parked truck, and was hit. He died, and his estate sued uh, our client, the broker. So <laughs> the truck was parked. We hadn't contracted with that trucking company. The truck was parked legally, yet our client, the broker, was dragged into that case. We, we got him out on summary judgment, but, you know, brokers... Uh, uh, many brokers know this, uh, are in the crosshairs now also in these cases. Huh. Yeah, it's a pretty tough place to place to be where, like, to your point, there's, there's really no knowledge of that going on, no control over it even. And it's, uh, I, I mean, I guess that goes back to my point around sort of opportunistic. You'd think as a, as a, as a lawyer looking at that case, you're just really looking at where is there potentially money, I suppose. It's really how you, I mean, I mean, being very, I'm very simplistic about that, but really, I guess you're going to try and go everywhere you can. Is, is that, I, I don't know if that's the logic. Well, here are the ingredients, Justin. So for brokers and others to be dragged into these cases, you, usually there's a motor carrier with statutory minimum levels of insurance. And a lot of people think that's $1 million in the U.S. It's not. It's 750000 So if there's a serious accident, the plaintiff's lawyer looks beyond that small level of insurance, because typically if that motor carrier only has statutory minimums, their pockets aren't that deep beyond the insurance mm -hmm. coverage. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they look up the chain uh, in the shipment schematic. They look for brokers who might have deeper pockets or better insurance policies. And amazingly, now a lot of shippers and consignees are being named in these lawsuits <laughs> also. And by shipper, uh, to be clear, I mean the consumer of the transportation services, the manufacturer where the, where the motor carrier picks up whatever they are hauling. Sure. And by the consignee, I mean the recipient of the load. So, you know, they the cycle escalates. They look for more entities to sue uh, with deeper pockets or better insurance coverage. And you know the frustrating thing in these cases for entities like that, for transportation brokers, for shippers and carriers, is that you most of the time you can get out of those cases on what's called a summary judgment motion. But to do that, you got to go through the entire discovery process. So written discovery, interrogatories, requests for production of documents, depositions of everybody. So, and then you got to file a, a well-researched motion for summary judgment and legal brief and support. Uh, that's a lot of expense, yeah. you know? And, and so if you're named uh, and you're not the motor carrier, it's quite hard to get out before all of that. So that makes it frustrating also. I can imagine. So let's, uh, I, I can hear, I can feel the listeners here saying, um, get me out of this. How do we mm -hmm. avoid this? So what are some of the things that companies should be doing uh, to help better ready themselves, prepare themselves, mitigate the risk around this? So let's go back to these sort of these magic five tips we talked about. What are some of these points in which they, they need to be thinking about, you know, immediately? Uh, Yes, let's go over those. So uh, these are things that the motor carrier, trucking company, and the broker too can do. Uh, this is primarily geared toward motor carriers, That's but okay. I think the brokers can learn from it too. Um, before an accident. I mean, I think there should be constant vigilance these days. So I represent a lot of motor carriers, right? And 99% and, and of them are not villains, to be vilified, right? So it's important to have within the company a very good safety culture. And by that I mean things like give awards for number of safe miles driven, give awards for uh, maintenance programs and effective maintenance and safe miles driven with well-maintained vehicles. Keep track of all that, have programs like that and give the awards. Uh, you know, 
a related topic, try to be involved in your own community for the company in some fashion, sponsor a little league team, a charity, because remember, we're telling the story in the litigation, in that videotape deposition I said, and my thesis is throughout the litigation, we try to push out those positives throughout the litigation. You can't push them out if they're not there. So um, some companies don't give awards, but they have very safe drivers. It's worth it to have that certificate and plaque on the wall to be able to, sh to counter the vilification. So have those in place so that they can be used by your defense lawyer to really help negate. Remember, this isn't even the fault for the accident to negate the vilification overall of the company. Um, so, so really, just in sort of summary, there, it's 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 build a, a build a brand and build a um, an emphasis around safety and build a a brand and an emphasis around. Um, your image really, right? This is what we're talking about. Just create a, create a good positive image for yourself. So in the event of you have uh, goodwill currency to use when needed in, 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 in case of a deposition. Is that a fair way to summarize that? that? That's an excellent summary and, and, and you know, two follow-up points and, and build that culture, build that brand, but make sure you're chronicling it, make sure you're documenting it. So there's mm -hmm. exhibits that your lawyers uh, can use. And of course, remember, I mean, building that culture does something else. Let's not forget, it helps prevent accidents in the first place. So, you know, it's a dual benefit, of Got course. It. That really minimizes risk, not having an accident. For sure. Um, I don't know how much time we have, but I can talk about a couple other hey, points. Keep going. We'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Um, I'll take all the time available. <laughs> yeah, we will take it all from you. <laughs> so, you know, I talked about the corporate representative deposition. Some call it a 30B6 deposition. It is of paramount importance, I think, these days to have a single person in the organization if you can. And we do a lot of training to our clients to make sure they pick the right person to do, to do the following. I mean, first of all, to be on top of the accident the minute it's, it happens, the minute the company is made aware of it, make sure there's a go team in place to get on out there and, and preserve and retain the evidence, inspect the scene, uh, but more than that these days. So it used to be, here's another thing that's flipped and changed, I think, in this type of litigation. We used to you know, say to our clients, and, and if we ever got calls from the press, just say no comment, we're in litigation. That is changing. There is a serious school of thought in the defense bar now that says it's the end of the no comment era. You got to say something. Um, jurors have a wider bandwidth. Uh, the plaintiff's counsel put things on their website. They've got the billboards. And a lot of times if you say no comment, people, some people presume, oh, that's not good. That means it's not good. So. I believe in these situations, it's good to help work up some type of statement for that person within the organization to present to the media if they inquire, to present to employees of the enterprise if he or she is talking to the family, to uh, be able to you know, convey sympathy to the family in the right way. Um, and that's the other thing, too, that person, I have a lot of clients who attempt, and this is a new thing, too, to reach out to the family or, or the, uh, I'm not going to say victim because you never know who hit whom, right? But the potential plaintiff before there's a lawsuit and empathize, personify mm. that person, him or herself, and the company, and even try to maybe negotiate some type of pre-litigation deal. I have clients, and this is an extreme, but you gotta have someone really good at it who go out and offer to pay medical expenses or make some type of offer. And the old school was, well, come on, you're admitting fault, aren't you? Um, and there's ways to keep that out, but you balance it because that can help prevent an entire lawsuit. You know, and then, too much for this uh, this particular podcast, but I mean, I have a whole list of things. How, 
how do you handle the funeral? How do you handle uh, the family? Other things you can do before the litigation to maybe prevent it, but if not, you know, reduce the vilification factor uh, as it goes into litigation. And, and by the way, that typically, that person would also be the person who you would want to kind of train to be the corporate spokesperson at that corporate representative deposition. If it's possible to have the same person, that usually makes the most sense. And, you know, it's kind of easier on the organization to have a, have a single person. But these days, I think there should be a point person for that type of unfortunate task. Do you see an, uh, an end to this? Do you see legislation that, that changes this or, or, or makes this a little less uh, one-sided? Or is, is I just kind of wondering around um, how that's being thought of maybe at, at government levels or if it even is. You know, for a Canadian, you have some good questions about the U.S. governmental structure, well, Justin. We, so uh, I, we, have a, we have a lot of American TV here. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> yeah. I, I just wrote an article on this, uh, and the answer is yes. So, you know, we got 50 states, and it, things vary from state to state, obviously. But, yes, state legislatures are becoming attuned to this phenomenon, and certain state legislatures believe that it isn't fair, really, uh, that, that litigation should be fair to both sides. So some examples, Texas has passed a, a very comprehensive statute that really addresses a lot of these concerns. It, it, uh, it limits non-economic damages, uh, limits punitive damages, uh, and those are, the, those are the types of damages that are, are, are hard to quantify, and that's where juries can really be inflamed. So that helps. This is off the top of my head, sure. but uh, it bifurcates the trial. So the jury has to find fault and have to fi find that the driver was acting within the scope of his or her employment before you even get to damages. And many excellent features that really help to tamp down this phenomenon. Other states aren't as comprehensive, but they have taken some action, and, and some of them are, uh, that come to mind, uh, Missouri, West Virginia, Iowa, Montana, Florida just this week passed a statute, I haven't studied it yet, but that helps to minimize uh, damages and certain types of frivolous lawsuits. So, yes, I mean, to distill it down, State legislatures are recognizing that this is a problem. Uh, they're recognizing that litigation should be fair, and, and, and some of them are doing something about it, and I think we'll see more of that. Great. Um, I just I have a, a bunch of uh, little notes in here that I want to make sure I got to. So what I'm going to do is like package these together as almost like a, like a lightning question. Um, and then so I'm going to just fire these at you, and you can fire them back at me, and we'll just kind of rip through as many as we we think is reasonable. So um, I thought this was interesting. So over the last 18 years and 36 cases, what is your record? <laughs> oh, we're talking about me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so sure. this um, actually is all about you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, let me let me uh, introduce that by saying as a prelude that one thing it's important to have in these cases uh, is a lawyer who is defending you as a motor carrier or a broker who does not fear trial you know, who's not afraid to go to trial and litigate. You know, there's a lot of lawyers who say they're litigators, but they're not really sure about trying cases. And if you are worried about trying cases, if you fear trial, that courses through every decision you make in the litigation, including settlement discussions. If you don't fear trial, that impacts every decision you make to your client's benefit, I believe. So, um, that's a long way of saying I don't fear trial, but uh, in, in the last uh, 18 years, Justin, I, I, I've tried uh, 36 cases. I'm 33 and three, so um, pretty good. It, yeah, would be a good say, it would be a good batting average. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure, yeah, sure would. It'd be a, it's a good, pretty it, much. It's not a lot of records that that wouldn't be that yeah, wouldn't be it, good. It, and out of modesty too. I mean, uh, a lot of that, of course, is knowing which cases are feasible to try right. and knowing which ones maybe should be settled. But uh, that decision usually doesn't get made uh, until the litigation unfolds a bit. So I have a note here. It says, um, 
Uh, Olympic fencing. Can I fair to care to uh, elaborate on what that is <laughs> pertaining to? Well, you know, over the years, I've litigated in many different f fora or forums, um, about 31 states, I'd say. Uh, the Surface Transportation Board, the Federal Maritime Commission, the Court of In International Trade, the Better Business Bureau, and uh, the, the U.S. Olympic Committee. So um, I, I did litigate a case before the USOC representing uh, an aspiring Olympic fencer, a young lady. Uh, I think it was the Moscow game, so I'm dating myself again. <laughs> and she was disqualified from the U.S. fencing team uh, because they were alleging she had taken some uh, illegitimate substance. Uh, and we presented a case that, no, this is normal medication for her. It's not a banned substance. And there was essentially a trial, and uh, we prevailed. So she was able to go over to Moscow and fence. I don't think she meddled, but but she competed for the U.S. So hey, man, you got her there. Yeah, and, and so I'm undefeated before the USOC. <laughs> That's my only case. Yeah. Um, okay, this is crazy, um, and I and I have to say that I have some very well traveled friends and consider myself pretty well traveled myself. Um, how many countries have you traveled to? You know, it, it, it's a nice even number, Justin. As of uh, March 2nd, I think it was, of this year, I, I've been to 100 countries. That is, so, I don't know anyone who's been to 100 countries, I don't think. Um, I, I was uh, in Benin in West Africa uh, on a trip and vacation, believe it or not. Not many people go to Benin on vacation. And also, I haven't heard of Benin. Yeah, it's a, it's a small little uh, country in the west coast of Africa, kind of like it's next to Togo. They're like Vermont and New Hampshire, but... <laughs> Anyway, I digress, but um, <laughs> when we crossed the border from Benin into Togo, that was my 100th country. So I remember it because it's a round number and, it, and it's fresh in my mind. And it's, it's incredible. And, and I think, and then through that, what I think has helped you in your travels is you speak seven languages to varying degrees of fluency, as you've noted here. So it's, it's not to say you're overly proficient in all of them, um, but I got to ask, what, what languages? Well, I, I majored in diplomacy and foreign affairs. You know, I, I can be a smooth guy when I want to be. Uh, but uh, I, so I studied it. a lot of languages in college. And once you learn one, like romance languages, the others become a little easier. But so I count English as one of the seven. So in, in ascending order, descending order of fluency, English, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, Russian, and Swedish... And as you said, I, I, I travel quite a bit, so I, I studied those, and I've kind of been to those countries to immerse myself a little bit, and so I remember quite a bit. So uh, I, you know, I like to have the opportunity to, to to use them when I can. So, what's the 101st country you're going to go to? Uh, well, they just started direct air service from Cleveland, where I'm from, to Dublin on Aer Lingus in May. Believe it or not, I've never been to Ireland, so I'm taking my wife and daughter to Ireland in May. So 101. So maybe next time we're on the show, we'll we'll, we'll re-up the count. So there will be new things in in the world of uh, of nuclear verdicts. It sounds like it's a it's a changing landscape. I think we've got a ton of content here. Um, you know, we talked a little bit before the show. I'd love to talk offline about creating some type of regular cadence. I think our listeners will get a ton of value from reading and, and hearing from you. Um, I think they got a ton of value today. I got a ton of value today. Um, and so you know, not to mention the uh, all the wonderful information and great travels. Um, you came super prepared and, uh, and and looking sharp as a tack. So thanks for uh, thanks for doing this and thanks for uh, coming up to uh, to Toronto to see us. You're welcome, Justin. And I had six pages here. I think we only touched on two, so I, I'm ready for round two Excellent. whenever you are. We'll have we'll have you back soon. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thanks everybody for listening. And don't forget to like, subscribe, or do whatever it is that you do to 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 help the show go a little bit more viral. Thanks, and we'll see you soon. <laughs>